Let's begin our time of evening worship by singing together, O Praise the Name.
Baptist Church, I want to give you a, a very warm welcome to our evening time of worship. And one of our members, Bill, uh, is now going to lead us in prayer and then read to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Thanks, Bill. Good evening, folks. Can we turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13? This is the story of Jesus speaking to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, a well-known story, particularly at this time of Easter. Luke 24, beginning at verse 13, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some woman of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find the body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now fast far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that very same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how it, he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Ending at verse 35, and we know that the Lord will add his blessing to this, the reading from his word. Amen. Can we now bow together in prayer? Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, on this Easter Sunday evening, we come to you given thanks. Dear Lord, we have on Friday, we read and we remember the story about the crucifixion, about how Christ went to his death for our sins. There were two criminals, one either side of him, one he redeemed and one rejected him. 
and he showed mercy to the one that was redeemed. And in that way, Lord, we know that he is risen, as it is said and as we read tonight, he rose on the third day. He's risen indeed to redeem us in his, uh, before his Father, our God. And we thank and we praise you, Lord. And we pray that we may, as with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, that we, our hearts may be stirred as we think of these things. Particularly, dear Lord, we come this Sunday evening remembering all that is happening in the world around us. Many folk will already have met together, worshipped, praised you, read from your word, and also heard preaching from your word. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray now that you will indeed be with us. Be close, we pray, dear Lord, at this time, this pandemic that is going around the world. Lord, to those that are believers who have hope, help us to continue in that hope. To those that do not have hope, Dear Lord, in your wisdom and in your providence and in your mercy, speak with them. Stir their hearts, Lord, towards repentance. We remember the ones in our own country, remembering our leaders. Thanking you, dear Lord, we know that you are risen, that you are ruler in our lives. But we thank you because we are, we are told to respect our rulers. And we thank you for the health of our Prime Minister and how he appears to be coming through the illness that he has. We pray for our leaders. We pray for wisdom. We pray that you may guide them, Lord. We pray even that as he lay on that bed, that Mr. Johnson may indeed have thought about his own place in eternity and, his, and where he is with you. We pray for those that are treating the sick, we pray that you will be close to them. For those that are ministering, particularly to ones who are worried about their loved ones who are sick, and also ones that may have passed away, Lord, be close, and may you indeed, in your spirit, be close to them, we pray. We pray for those in our fellowship. We thank you that we are able to meet together here this Sunday evening, even remotely, even virtually, as they say, in this, in this means, and we thank you for the means to do so. We praise you, Lord, that we are able to meet together and we log and look forward to the day whenever we can meet together and be converse and commune with each other face to face. But in the meantime, Lord, bless us. Bless us as a fellowship. Bless us in our witness to those around us, both believers and particularly non-believers and those we come in contact both in our own families and around about us. And dear Lord, we pray now this evening for your blessing on our service. We pray that you will be with our Pastor Joe as he takes from our word and preaches from our word that which you have laid on his heart. Bless us and we ask that all this in and through the name of thy Son, our Lord Jesus, for to him be the glory forever and forever. Amen. Sarah Morrison, as some of you know, arrived home at the end of last week and she's now going to give us a short update of her adventures so far. Uh, after Sarah's finished, we're going to sing a new Easter song, Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. Thanks very much, Sarah. Hey, uh, hi everyone. Um, so it's nice to be able to come and chat with this this evening. Um, we've been asked just to give a wee update about um, the last couple of weeks and how we've come to now be back in Northern Ireland. Um, so I guess things all kind of started to change when the guys were out. Um, they were getting messages and we were getting messages from home from people who um, were concerned that the airspace would close and that they wouldn't get home and we had to then make a decision whether mm -hmm. we were wanting to stay or wanting to go. And I guess Katie and I <clears throat> we had a real peace about staying so we were happy to stay um, and then our main concern was trying to get the guys out so thankfully we got them onto um, an earlier flight on the Friday and they were able to get home um, and then actually by the Sunday the airspace had closed within Nigeria so it had. Yeah and I guess during that week things were starting to change day by day uh, and it came to the point where we, we were being advised to come home so as we were looking into different flight opportunities obviously the 
Abuja airport was being closed for a month um, but we contacted the Irish and the British Embassy and um, we're starting to get some updates from them and it turned out that there was going to be an Austrian airline that was flying out and I guess we only really decided fully within about a day, a day and a half that we were going to go for this so everything was happening very quickly um, and we weren't really able to say proper goodbyes um, but even just the process of getting up to Abuja we had to have official documents because the whole Abuja was on lockdown and we had to get police as well to take us safely up to Abuja um, but we're really thankful that the journey went very smoothly and that there was no problems as we were going through the different airports to Abuja to Vienna, Vienna to Amsterdam <coughs> and Amsterdam to Dublin yeah, so thankfully we arrived home safely um, last Saturday night. Um, so it's about a week now we've been home. Um, it is obviously crazy. Normally when we come home, um, you know, you go, you're able to see your family, you're able to see your friends. But at the minute we're in quarantine and we're not able to go to the shops or anything. So we're relying on people and um, we're very thankful for um, all the people who have been um, helping us and um, being <coughs> sending wee messages and different things because it is quite hard coming from that situation where you know you're very quickly just transported out of a country where you've like made a wee home for yourself and now you're at home but you can't see any of your family and your friends but we know that everyone's going through this and um, it's not just that that we're going through it either but um, <coughs> yeah so just we want to give you a couple of prayer points <coughs> so we do um, yeah, so our first prayer point is definitely for the hospital back in Kogi. Um, thankfully at the minute there are no cases within Kogi State, but obviously that could change um, because they are a few weeks behind us. Um, so our prayer is for the hospital management that they'll be able to make um, wise decisions um, and will continually seek God in their decision making processes. And obviously for the staff and our friends that we've left behind um, so quickly that they would just be protected throughout this period um, of time and um, yeah so that's the first prayer point yeah second prayer point is just continue to pray for the various ministries that we were involved in for kingdom kids and the secondary program as well and the different outreaches that we were involved in and um, obviously like everywhere they've had to stop um, and we weren't able to say the reasons fully why and to say a proper goodbye to the children and the young people um, but we just pray that what they've been taught over the years, they would just um, remember it and that during this time that they would draw closer to God. And obviously there were different volunteers that were helping, um, but they haven't come to that level of maybe carrying it on themselves whenever um, the this COVID would finish. But we just pray that in the future they would be able to continue. Yeah, and I guess personally for myself, um, I probably will look into starting work now within the next couple of weeks um, and so my idea is that possibly I might not live at home just for the risk that I could be um, bringing something back to mum and dad so um, it's just guidance over where I should be living um, um, in the interim period of, of working during these uncertain times. And I guess just for myself, obviously being a teacher, uh, obviously schools aren't, aren't working at this time, but I just pray that God will be able to use me some way during this time. Um, and obviously Nigeria is on both of our hearts mm -hmm. and we just pray towards the future of how God will continue to guide us uh, and lead us uh, in the future. Yeah, and we'd also just, both of us would just like to say thank you for all your prayers um, all your support, not only when we were in Nigeria and have been there, you know, um, throughout the time, but also in these last few weeks, we know you have been praying, even the safety and the journey, um, you know, we know um, people at home have been praying. So we like to thank you for that and yeah. thank you as well, just for your continued um, prayer, even that we're here now and your support, people just bringing um, food and different things like that. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, um, we really appreciate it. Definitely appreciate yeah. it all. Yeah, thank you. So it's been nice to chat to you. Um, yeah, so we'll hopefully see you soon in person. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days 
Please turn in your Bible to Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. I like all the, the resurrection story, but I, I do really appreciate this part of the story. The woman who trudged through the streets of Jerusalem on Sunday morning to anoint the dead body of Jesus were de dejected, disappointed and crushed. The cross of Calvary had blasted their hopes to tatters. Their minds were not thinking about the resurrection of Jesus. They were, in fact, preoccupied with who would help them roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb so that they could do for the body of Jesus what the hours of the Sabbath had denied him. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in a state of shock as the sword of affliction continued to pierce, pierce her soul. She had witnessed the criminal death of her loving, caring, firstborn son on a cross. The eleven, well, they were hiding in the upper room. Their faces resembled the look of condemned men. Their master was gone. Their friend was no more. Their plans wrecked. Their hopes shattered. They'd pinned their confidence on a, a last-minute reprieve, but that had been dismissed. 
and all they expected now was the knock of the executioner. Am I exaggerating? Was there not so much as a, a flickering ray of hope shining through the clouds of gloom? Is there not one, not one among the disciples who remembers the words of Jesus concerning his death and resurrection? And the answer to that is no, not one. Listen to the response of the disciples when the women breathlessly told them that Jesus was risen in verse 11 of chapter 24. And these words seemed to them like an idle tale. Another word for idle tale is nonsense. And they did not believe them. No one expected Jesus to rise from the grave. He was dead. He was buried. He was no more. Their happy days of fellowship were ended. Even Peter, having ran to the tomb and found it empty, was not still convinced. Verse 12. Indeed, all those who had followed Christ were still in despair that Sunday afternoon, though they had heard bits and pieces about, a, about the empty tomb. Well, I want to pick up the story as two of them were on the road to a village named Emmaus, located about seven miles from Jerusalem. I want you to note that this was a walk of disappointment and delusionment. One is identified as Cleopas, while the other is not. It was springtime, yet they refused to hear the chirping of the birds as they began to roost for the night. They took no notice of the awakening buds of nature. With heavy feet, they trudged back to their lodgings in Emmaus. And as they walked, they talked about what had happened that day. Verse 14. For the life of them, they could not understand why Jesus had allowed himself to be arrested and put to death. To them, he was not only a great rabbi, but also a powerful prophet. And, and they had known of his supernatural powers. Surely he only needed to speak and no one, no one could have opposed him. They had hoped, verse 21, that he was the one to redeem Israel. But a Messiah, a Messiah who managed to get himself imprisoned and handed over to the Romans who then crucified him, was a great disappointment and delusion. They had supported Jesus while he was alive and because of that their life had not been easy and now they ached with grief and confusion. The scriptures had promised a Messiah and they had thought they had believed that Jesus was the one but he had not delivered. Did God care? And did he did? The resurrected Lord understood the confusion of their hearts. Cleopas and his friend moved ever so slowly along the road to Emmaus. Perhaps others hurried past them. They took no notice. The fact that the evening shadows were lengthening, well, it didn't matter to them. However, the resurrected Christ knew not only their geographical location, he also knew the turmoil of their thoughts. The omniscient Saviour understood. This theological term, omniscience, used to describe God's perfect knowledge, sounds so cosmic and cold, but Christ's knowledge of his followers is tender and personal. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 139, verse 2 and 3, You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. I have no doubt that God was eavesdropping in on the two friends' conversations. The Bible tells us in Malachi 3.16 that God in fact, listens to our conversations. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Wow. Imagine. God listens into our conversations. The perfect knowledge of God concerning his people well, it should do two things. 
Firstly, it should stop believers going to places, entering into practices and engaging in conversations that Jesus would not be pleased with. A rule of thumb for every believer should be, would Jesus be pleased with where I am? Would he be pleased with what I am doing? And would he be pleased with what I am saying? If you can answer yes to these three questions, you will not be in the business of grieving the heart of your Saviour and Lord. Secondly, if you are a follower of Jesus, his knowledge about you should bring great comfort to your soul. Christians often feel insignificant and alone in this world, but when you see Jesus fresh from the trauma of death and resurrection monitoring the footsteps and even the heartbeats of a despairing couple, you know that you too are known and loved. Their walk of disappointment and delusionment became the way of encounter and inquiry. We do not know how Jesus positioned himself to intercept the couple, but he did manage to walk with them. Although the friends could see they were restrained from recognising Jesus, it is amazing, is it not, that Jesus was so near and yet they didn't even know it. Is this not repeated over and over again in our lives when the trials of life surround us? Even though we cannot see him, we must understand and believe Jesus is always near. To them he was a stranger, perhaps an unwelcome stranger who joined them on their walk home to Emmaus. And he did more than walk with them. He he asked them a question, verse 17. What, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. I wonder, have you ever asked your wife or your husband or a friend a question and and having asked, you know by their reaction, the look on their face that you should never have asked it in the first place. It would seem to me this is the kind of reaction Jesus got. Cleopas's response was mingled with depression and biting sarcasm, verse 18, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, if I had received that answer, I probably would have, well, I probably would have backed off. But graciously, Jesus prods a little more, verse 19. What things? His second inquiry got them to express their confusion and Please note that it says that both of them answered, verses 19 to 24, and they, plural, said. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, It is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. They were so depressed and so negative in their confusion that it was beyond their capacity to make the the obvious connection, to join up the dots. If you've had the misfortune to be depressed or if you've tried to help someone depressed, you will know that such people are amazingly resourceful in finding reasons not to take comfort in anything you might say to them. They are determined to hear everything as bad news And that is exactly what these two did with the news of the empty tomb. To them, the empty tomb compounded the tragedy, for they probably thought that someone had stolen the body of Jesus, adding insult to injury. So the good news was bad news to them. Ironically, both had mentioned in reply to this question that it had been three days from the death of Jesus, but they did not recall 
that he had said over and over and over again before his crucifixion that he would be put to death and he would rise again on the third day. Well, they let it all out, their confusion, their depression, their disillusionment, their shrinking faith, even their anger. And here's the wonderful thing, Jesus did not reject them for it. Had he not coaxed the couple to reveal their true thoughts, which were by and large their doubts, and when they did so, Jesus answered. Jesus honours spiritual honesty. Our Lord invites honesty from his people. He, he wants us to tell him the truth, understanding that we are not revealing anything new to him because he already knows. Well, the way of encounter and inquiry became words of revelation and realisation. Jesus gently rebukes them, verse 25, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Certainly they, they both believed the prophets, but they were selective in what they believed. They had read and believed the Messiah ruler passages, but they ignored the passages that prophesied his sufferings. Foolish people indeed, slow of heart to believe indeed. But hold on a moment, is that not a reflection of a number of you who are listening? Let me make a, a calculated guess that every person listening has heard the way of salvation at one time or another. And yet there are some who are not Christians. Why is that? Knowing that you've sinned against God and, and need to be forgiven by repentance and faith in the finished work of Christ or, or suffer the consequences of your sinning, you selectively discharge yourself from the claims of Scripture. Some of you selectively say, God will not contemn me to hell because I'm not a bad person. I'm, I'm a good person and after all, he's a God of love. O oh, foolish people, God will keep his promise to you of hell just as he will keep his promise of heaven to those who repent and believe. Some of you selectively say, I'm not ready to be saved. O oh, slow of heart. If you know that you need to be saved, then you're definitely ready to be saved. How long will you go on selectively discharging yourself from your responsibility to be saved by faith in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ until you are selected out of humanity by death for your just rewards? O oh, foolish people, and slow of heart to believe. Well, Jesus does a, a truly wonderful thing, doesn't he? Verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This was exegetical heaven. The root word, or the root idea of the word interpreted, is the word from which we derive the word hermeneutics, which is the science of Bible interpretation. Imagine the word of God incarnate explaining the written word of God. Moreover, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Have you ever wondered what he said, what he, what he explained? Do you think he made reference to Abraham's intended sacrifice of Isaac as a emblematic of his substitutionary sac sacrifice? To hear the Saviour's discourse on the messianic significance of the Passover lamb as it related to his own suffering and death, his body and blood. Is it possible that Jesus taught them on how the tabernacle and the temple pointed to him, that he indeed is the temple? And surely he mentioned the grand images that spoke of him, such as the, the manna and the bronze serpent. And he must have taken them through Isaiah 53. How could he leave out showing them that he was numbered 
with the transgressors and buried with the rich. He must have unpacked Psalm 22, beginning with those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then applied it to his work on the cross. The more Jesus opened the word, the faster their pulses must have raced. This stranger on the road to a mess established for them that the suffering and death were not obstacles to Jesus the Messiah. In fact, they made his claim to be Messiah all the more credible and compelling. The real Messiah had to suffer. The real Messiah had to die. And the real Messiah would rise from the dead. We're not told of the reaction of these two disciples at this moment in time, but surely it must have been one of breathless amazement. Their disappointment and their delusion began to melt like frost before a hot sun. The truth of the scriptures were alive to these two as never before. What grief they would have spurred themselves if they had not been so selective in their beliefs. If we find ourselves hurting and despairing and do not find the scriptures speaking to our condition, it's not the Bible's fault. It's because we do not know our Bibles well enough. And that which we do not know well enough cannot profoundly comfort us. Everything to do with Christian salvation and Christian peace is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Now they began to understand why the tomb was empty. Could I suggest they were divinely kept from recognizing Jesus so that they would base their understanding of the resurrection squarely on the, uh, the, the scriptures and not on experience? A privileged experience such as this is not grounded on the word runs the danger of becoming a privatized eccentric interpretation. The couple on the road to Emmaus were in no such danger. Their belief in the resurrection rested on the scripture before they saw Jesus for who he really was. Well, Jesus indicates that he's, he is further to go, but the two urge him to stay. And this word these words urged him in verse 29 carries the idea of force. In other words, they insisted that he stayed, and we can understand why. But when the evening meal was prepared, their guest took his place. Verse 30, 31. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Many believe that the moment of recognition came when they saw his nail-pierced hands. That might have been the case, but they were certainly jolted. The truth that the risen Christ, their Jesus, is risen from the grave must have been an explosive moment. It was a moment that would be burnt into their minds for time and eternity. And then he was gone. But by this time their hearts were set on fire. Listen to what they said to each other in verse 32. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Their winter of soul was replaced by spring's warm, refreshing sunshine. Likewise, it is when the scriptures come alive in our souls with the centrality and the reality of Jesus Christ. Many today complain that Sunday services are long and boring. I wonder, could it be that through the week such Christians have not been walking and listening to their Saviour through the reading of the Bible. Surely if your heart is warmed six days of the week, they will burst into flames as you worship God on a Sunday in a way that is pleasing to him. 
Two souls were left, flaming in the dark and a mess. Jesus was gone bodily, but the warmth of his presence remained with them. Otherwise, they would have not rushed from their table back to Jerusalem with their dynamic news. You see, sensible Palestinians do not or did not travel lonely roads at night for fear of thieves or wild animals. But these two disciples of Christ could not be kept where they were. They couldn't keep the news to themselves. They had to share it. Verse 33 to 35. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord has risen indeed and appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Surely if a man or woman has a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, the world has got to know it. They would see Jesus a little later that same evening along with the apostles in the upper room. But for now they were thrilled that Peter had seen Jesus too. And all were now beginning to believe this wonderful truth that Jesus Christ was risen. This was the beginning of glowing hearts in a cold world of sin. In closing, let me assure you that even though 2,000 plus years have passed since the resurrection, the risen Saviour knows where you are. He knows the geography of your lives inside out. He knows the temperature of your heart, whether you are burning with salvation or the icy death of sin. His method has not changed. He meets you where you are with his own person framed in the beautiful context of his word. The life-giving truth that Jesus has suffered, died for our sins and has risen from the dead according to the scriptures is still true today. He is the Messiah. He is the saviour of souls. He is the Lord. But is he your saviour? Is he your Lord? He still delights to bring fire to cold hearts. Thank you, Father, for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for the the personal touch of Jesus getting alongside two believers who were in the midst of depression not understanding, not fully grasping what the death of Jesus meant for them. But we thank you, O God, that through your Son you came and you walked alongside them and you talked to them and you explained to them and you explained to them this wonderful good news that Jesus has risen and that he warms cold and depressed hearts. Again, Father, we thank you that we're on the victory side. We thank you that he is a risen saviour. We thank you that he is an interceding saviour. And we thank you that he's a coming again saviour. O Lord, may our cold hearts be warmed with this truth. May our cold hearts be warmed with the truth that Jesus knows all about us. And in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our trials, even when we can't see him, he is very near. O God, thank you again for this Easter Sunday. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. May you be pleased to bless us and to do us good. May our hearts Just be warmed with the truth that he is risen and that he is coming again to take us home. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you over this Easter holiday period. And let us close by singing Salvation's song. Amen. Before the 
dawn of time Chosen by my Maker Hidden in my Savior I am His And He is mine Cherished for eternity When I'm staying with guilt and sin He is there to live Love's unfading splendor, earth.